Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us on this sunny Friday afternoon um, for our lunchtime Cavendish Talks session today. We've got a great webinar for you. We've got an excellent panel of speakers to you, and we're going to be talking about Ports Gateways to Growth in the Southeast today. So what are we going to be talking about? We're going to be talking about the changing role that ports play in spearheading innovation and future technology, and what more needs to be done to unlock that potential and to help them to drive coastal growth. So this is the latest in our Cavendish Talks series. Um, I'll talk a little bit at the end of the uh, end of the webinar about what other sessions we've got on, but really delighted to be with you today. So I'm Daniel Frid. I'm a director at Cavendish, um, and I've spent a significant portion of my career working with politicians, developers and infrastructure providers in coastal regions right across the south of the country. And I'm joined by a wonderful panel today. We're joined by Kate Willard, OBE. She's the chair of Thames Estuary Growth Board. She's the government appointed Thames Estuary Envoy. We're joined also by Doug Bannister, Chief Executive Officer of the Port of Dover. Steve Beale may well join us at some point throughout the webinar. I think he's having some issues joining at the moment. So if you do see him appear, um, we'll get a chance for him to speak as well. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Freeport East. Also delighted to be joined by Ben Murray, Group Director of Government and Corporate Affairs at Harland and Wolf. So, um, briefly on logistics, we've got an hour set aside. Although a couple of our speakers have to run off early, so we will be uh, we'll try and keep things brief and cover all the key topics as soon as we can. We'll have presentations from each of our panelists, uh, and then in the second half we'll open up for a Q and A session in the second half of the presentation. So you have the ability to ask questions. There is a panel to the right hand side of your screen if you'd like to put in any questions that come into your mind throughout the presentation please do and then myself and james warner who's behind the scenes will have a look at those questions and what we'll do is we'll put those to the panel and we'll have a discussion about them in the second half of the discussion so please do send them in so before i hand over to my first speaker i just want to set the scene a little in terms of what we're looking at so to say that the uk economy is reliant on ports is something of an understatement Without ports, there is no economy. 95% of UK global trade relies entirely on ports. So some figures for you. The sector contributes 10.8 billion in value to the UK economy, which is more than air, rail, warehousing, and storage. And that role is only getting more critical. The journey to net zero is hugely reliant on having innovative, efficient port systems in place. Ports are spearheading innovation in fields like hydrogen, carbon capture technology. You'll hear a bit, a bit about that today. And they're also uh, essential for actually delivering those things. These turbines don't just appear in the water overnight. These high voltage cables don't just appear in the water. We rely on ports to be able to put them in place and make them a reality. So if ports are spearheading and trailblazing this new technology, the question is, what does that mean for the communities that they're situated in? What does that mean for the coastal communities that these ports call home, often some of the most deprived areas in the country, areas like Jaywick, the Isle of Grain, Ramsgate, places that we've worked, places that I've worked over the years, and you can see the disparity between the growth, innovation, and then the hardship there. So what does it mean for more infrastructure, more homes concentrated around key ports? And does it mean that investment, upskilling, government support is needed in some of these key coastal communities? That is the cut and thrust of what we're going to be looking to talk about today with some experts right across the business who know this stuff inside out. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my first speaker, Kate Willard, OBE. Thank you very much Thank indeed. Can everybody hear me? Is that good? Dan, give me a thumbs up. Yeah, All great. Thumbs Kate, up, yeah. Dan. Fantastic. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome and welcome to Friday, indeed. End of a long week for all of us, I'm sure. Um, a real delight to be with you this morning. Uh, Oh, in fact, it's afternoon, isn't it? There we go. A um, couple of words, uh, first of all, about the uh, Thames Estuary, for those of you that don't know us. So I'm Kate, I'm chair of the Thames Estuary Growth Board. The Thames Estuary is uh, one of government's appointed pan-regional partnerships. So we are a coherent economic geography across the southeast. We cover basically the space from St Paul's Cathedral and then out to South End on the Essex coast and out to Ramsgate uh, on the Kent coast. 
and obviously the beating heart of our region, the river in between. Um, a landscape which has inspired artists from Canaletto to Constable and, and, and Dickens to Wordsworth, um, and a landscape which is about a thousand square miles and embraces about four million people. Our job in a nutshell uh, is to deliver 1.3 million jobs, a million new homes, and 190 billion GVA to the British economy. So we will have done that by Tuesday of next week. Uh, only joking, we've got quite a long window of opportunity, but you get the drift. We're a, we're a great landscape, uh, an internationally uh, reaching landscape, uh, with, a, with a job to deliver, excuse the police car, a job to deliver good green growth. And as part of that, to make a contribution to the British economy. So ports, gateways to growth, um, I thought I'd start with a kind of question there because, uh, interestingly, the Thames Estuary used to be called the Thames Gateway. And I really struggled with that as a concept because what that kind of means is um, here's something that you pass through and it has no function or value in itself. Uh, so, uh, so now, and all of you on this call will now know if I ever hear you refer to the Thames Gateway, uh, I will punch you. Uh, we are the Thames Estuary because that is a place that does things. And so, my first question when I was thinking about speaking this morning was, um, are ports gateways to growth or are they indeed engines for growth themselves? I, I would argue quite vociferously that they are the latter, that they are indeed engines for growth themselves, um, because whilst technically speaking, they are something that things and people pass through, they themselves as constructs are engines. Uh, so that was my first question. So I'm just going to run through and I'm not going to speak for a long time because I, I always think that the, the these the most interesting bits of, of events like this is when people get to ask questions and we start to challenge each other's assumptions and presumptions. Um, but just to, 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 to sort of canter through a couple of the things, uh, areas where I think ports are absolutely legitimate engines. So ports, uh, and this is from, from our perspective on the estuary, so ports are a fully fledged legitimate engine um, for our global reach. So technically speaking, they reach globally, but if I think about some of the work that we're doing, those global uh, contacts are actually a really important part of the economic growth that we're delivering. So for example, we're working with the Great Lakes ports at the moment, so Indiana, Chicago, Duluth, all those kind of guys, really interesting global reach there because not only are those ports really interested in talking to us about, and by us, I mean our port colleagues, um, you know, around what are we doing with hydrogen on ports? What are we doing with digitization? How are we matching productivity? But actually, those Great Lakes ports really want to reach into London. They want a practical connection into London for their trade. So the ability for ports to legitimize and provide content and drive for our global partnerships is absolutely critical. Secondly, um, ports are innovators. Now we know innovation is incredibly important in terms of economic growth, but ports as innovators are absolutely, in, in many ways, uh, I, I probably include airports actually in here as well, but, but, but let's, generally speaking, um, are, are, are really world-class. You know, look at what they're doing in Rotterdam with hydrogen. This this port is absolutely world class in terms of the way that it's looking at, at freight operations and indeed digitization, uh, as many of my other colleagues on this call are today. Uh, but ports are, are, are legitimate world class innovators. Three, ports have a really important role to play in um, the management of the relationship between land and water. So I think about the Thames, we have very big issues on the Thames around flood resilience. So working with the Environment Agency on, you know, changing sea levels and uh, as a result of climate warming, etc. Ports have a key role in understanding how flood resilience can be effective, both in terms of managing the environmental impacts of rising sea levels, but also recognising that development needs to take place to deliver us jobs and economic growth. So ports have got a really important role in terms of environmental protection and flood resilience. Four, ports obviously are really important when it comes to global trade because that's what you guys do. Uh, best example we've got in the estuary is obviously we have a free port and that free port is going to be really driving up global trade from, 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 from the, the estuary. But, you know, we had a very interesting event uh, this week uh, that the Growth Board hosted um, all of the ambassadors of uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. We took them on the river <clears throat> because 31% 
of the inbound and outbound freight, waterborne freight from the South Americas comes into the estuary ports, 31%. Now that's a big foundation for us to build on, but obviously really legitimizes that role of ports and their role in global trade. Five, no, four, sorry, four, four. Ports have a really important role to play in brand and place, yeah? If I just think about, you know, two of the very obvious ports to pick up on, on the estuary, you know, Tilbury. Tilbury welcomed in 1948 the SS Empire Windrush. That's a very important part of the cultural history of the estuary, of our country. So Tilbury's got a really big role there in understanding what the estuary is as a place, how uh, it, it has been reflective of, of cultures it has welcomed. And again, you know, a completely different example. Think about the cranes at DP World. I'm guessing that everybody on this call, however well you know the estuary or not, you can picture those huge cranes. They are breathtakingly big and, and, and absolutely iconic. So everything from cultural significance to visual iconography, ports have a role to play in brand and place. So ports, global reach, ports, innovators, ports, flood resilience, ports, global trade, ports, brand and place. But the sixth one is even more important. And this is ports as the engines to deliver on the agenda that government referred to as levelling up. We just call it the fairness agenda. Um, we have uh, 10 of the prior 12 priority places in the southeast for deprivation in the estuary. We have some of the poorest communities uh, in the country in the estuary. Um, and for many of those communities, uh, there has been investment. There's been government investment in some of those places. They've had towns fund money or high streets money or business improvement money or further education money or money, 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 money. Uh, but all of you on this call know that actually uh, you can chuck all the money in the world at a place and unless you really understand what you're doing with that money, it will have the, the result of absolutely making fuck all difference, yeah? That, that, that's the reality. We see it, don't we? We see, we see, we see big cities and, and big towns saying, government, give me a grant, we've got poverty, and you give me a grant, and overnight I will eradicate poverty. It's all going to be fine. No, it fucking won't be. So what we're doing on the history is something quite different. We are understanding in an absolutely data-driven way the issues in these communities. So I can say to you now, I've got some issues in parts of South End. I could say that to you last year. We published something called the Leveling Up Atlas. If you want to look on the Growth Board's website, you can see that, which shows you all these hot spots of deprivation. We've overlaid more data onto that and more data and more data. So now it's not just this area of South End or this estate in South End, it's this street and it's Dave at number 37. And then what we've done is we've spoken to Dave. First of all, Dave told us to fuck off. Well, why wouldn't he? because his family have suffered intergenerational exclusion from, the, from any kind of economic or social activity. He has been excluded from the normal world, yeah? Then Dave rang us, this is a real story, the name has been changed. Uh, the next day Dave rang us up, yeah? He said, all right, I will speak to you. So we paid Dave for his time. That itself is appropriate as well. We paid Dave for his time. And now we know that the reason why Dave is excluded is because uh, the job that he wants and that he could get and that he is skilled for, but really importantly, the one that he wants. He can't get it because he hasn't got a bus, and he hasn't got a car. And actually, we also know that's the same situation for some of Dave's friends as well. So what's been happening, potentially, is that we've been building a new FE college, business improvement district, I've got nothing against business improvement districts, but you get my drift. We've done this, we've invested here, da da da. You know what, Dave needs a fucking bus. That's what will make the difference to Dave. Yeah. And so when I hear and we will be doing this with the Freeport, when I hear because we all know, don't we, that we have ports and then we have surrounding areas of deprivation. It is very typical for that to happen and sometimes extreme deprivation. When I hear ports talking about their relationship with their communities, I will be Ben, Doug, anyone, all of you. I will be challenging you and saying to you, how do you know what your communities need? How do you know that you are providing appropriate access for your communities to the great jobs that you're creating, the great opportunities, great careers that you are providing? How do you know that works for Dave? 
because I tell you something, it works for our investors. When I speak to investors, because we are able to speak to that level of granularity, serious investors, and I'm talking big, big, big investment, international investment houses that we're speaking to for the estuary, they love this because they, the proper investors, who really, really are onto that EDI, that inclusive, that social agenda, they do want to make sure that their investment is providing a bus for Dave and not just providing some gloss, yeah? So Port's amazing global reach. Port's are outrageously fabulous innovators. Port's are so important in terms of flood resilience. Port's enable us to have global trade. Port's are a really big part of our identity, our brand and our place. But Port's need to take a properly responsible social and economic role in making sure the growth that you are delivering is fair. Uh, on that note, I'll close. Thank you very much. Cheers. Hey, thank you so much. It's always an absolute pleasure to hear you speak with real, true, genuine passion about the areas that you work in. So thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to pick up on some of those questions as part of the Q&A. We've got some excellent uh, areas to talk about. I wonder, Doug, if you might be able to touch on a few of those things as part of your presentation. Over to you, Doug. Uh, very good. Uh, 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 you're you're driving, right? Yes. Yeah. All good. I'll flip the next. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's it's always very challenging to follow Kate. Uh, so I will I'll do my best to. So uh, uh, and I'll and I'll I'll uh, I'll crank through a, a bit of material. So um, what I was mainly going to talk about is. Uh, uh, you know, how do we address the sustainable growth um, from Port's perspective? But just to put it into context, uh, Port of Dover, uh, we are the primary gateway between the United Kingdom and the European Union. 33%, a third of all trade between the United Kingdom and the European Union comes across our docks. We do that in uh, about two and a half million trucks. Uh, we have 130 ferry crossings in a day, leading to about 17,000 during the course of the year. We're also a big uh, travel gateway with 11 million passengers and 2 million cars and, and um, uh, many coaches as well. So that's sort of the context of the Port of Dover. Now, why do people chase it? Uh, choose us. Uh, next slide, please. They choose us uh, uh, and we're a very popular gateway. So as you can see, uh, if you look at the EU UK trade in TEU terms, 20 foot equivalent terms, uh, Dover and Eurotunnel are the, the two main players with, with Dover sort of dominating. Um, uh, and we do this because of our unrivaled geographic proximity to the, our main trading um, partner being the European Union. Uh, highly productive, highly efficient assets are each ferry can do up to five round voyages in a day. We turn our land over six times every day. The berths get turned over 10 times every day. Uh, it's a hugely productive asset. Uh, and you know the equivalent. If if there was a if there was a desire to go to the next most efficient uh, route, uh, then uh, in, instead of Dover, they'd have a truck would have to wait in Dover for 16 hours and miss over 20 ferry crossings for it to make sense to go somewhere else. That's why they choose. I'd also say too that Dover, very little of our freight remains in Kent or the local area. Most of it goes nationwide, all four corners of, of the United Kingdom. Half of our freight is destined north of London. Uh, so it really is when you talk about leveling up, the reach that we have across the entire nation is just so important to factor in. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, in, in thinking about what sustainable development looks like, in uh, in 20, uh, in 2021, we, we launched our sustainability agenda. Uh, and you can see along the right hand side of the chart, it's not just about um, uh, it's not just about you know reducing carbon emissions. It's about everything that would have an impact on on humanity. Uh, the people that work for us, our customers, the port users, everybody. But then just zeroing in on the on the carbon commitments, we made a commitment at that point in team time to be net carbon zero for our operations at scope one and two by 2025. Folks, that's not 2030, that's not 2040, it's not 2050. It's a couple of years from now. And the important thing with that is we know what we need to do. We've already reduced our carbon emissions by 95% since we started tracking in 2007. 
but we're not stopping there. So by 2030, we're looking to bring into the fold certain scope three emissions and decarbonize those as well. And then ultimately, we're looking to create a green shipping corridor between the United Kingdom and France, which would be truly net zero uh, uh, starting from, from 2030. Next slide, please. With this, though, it's so important that we adopt a partnership uh, working methodology. So we've got our target 25 or our target uh, 2030. The establishing of our green shipping corridor, we're working with a uh, through the Clean Maritime Demonstration Competition and other initiatives. We've pulled together a powerful coalition of, of, of folks that have this, that share the same aim. We went so far that in March this year, 2023, we're over in Dunkirk and the Port of Dover, Port of Dunkirk, Port of Calais, and DFDS all signed a memorandum of understanding to decarbonize the channel. And important and imperatively, that is around the electrification of, of ships, basically. Uh, uh, and then we need to be putting in all the effort and the energy that we can to try and lift these initiatives so that we can indeed decarbonize. You, you saw how important the Port of Dover and our roots are for the overall prosperity of, of, of the United Kingdom. Uh, and if this UK supply chain, global supply chains are going to be decarbonized, we're taking a leadership position and leading the way here in Dover. Next slide, please. But that doesn't come without challenges. So we've spent a lot of time analyzing what our energy demands would be. And here's an example of two scenarios. Scenario one is where we, uh, we call the high electrification one. And that's where we electrify uh, the ferries and, uh, and the HGVs. Uh, and scenario two is that more, on a more hydrogen. But you can see in this, in this scenario one, we're looking at uh, uh, an electricity demand of 160 megawatts. Uh, for the port operation. Uh, you can click and click again. Please. Now, now one of the challenges is, is and with many ports, we're, we're not, we're, we're along the coast, right? So uh, by our nature. So we don't necessarily have a whole lot of stuff sat right around us. So the proximity to the national grid for us is, is pretty remote. On the map there, you can see where the interconnectors come in from France, and they kind of go right past Dover, and then they go up to a place called Selinge, the ones to the south at least. So we're looking for 160 megawatts. Right now, today, we've got eight. The gap is enormous. This is going to be hundreds of millions of pounds worth of investment that's going to be required, and not all of it can come from our operations. We're, we're, we're 80, 90 million pound turnover business. So one of the one of the things is getting a prior, priority connections into the grids, as Kate said, around being engines of growth. You know, ports primarily have that function, but in order to deliver that function, they need to be higher up the the, the food chain for grid connections. So right now, it is done on first come first serve. So if you're a retail center, if you're a hospital or a school or a shopping mall or a, a, a new housing development, you put in your bids. Uh, a lot of this stuff can't happen if the ports uh, aren't connected to the grid. Next slide, please. So the challenge that we have is, is where does the energy get produced? How does it get stored and distributed? And then we get into the infrastructure in the ports and the ferries. Now there's an interplay here or the ships. There's an interplay here, and that is the ferries, the, the ship operators are unlikely to invest in electric ships if there isn't the power in the ports to be able to fuel them. Likewise, we won't bring the power into the ports to recharge the ferries unless we've got a commitment that they're going to be electrified. And this is one of the challenges that we have here. So if we had 160 megawatts ready to go in our port now, then we'd have electric ferries coming out of the shipyards. Uh, but we don't. So that interplay is, it becomes really important. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, really where, where we, can, we should be going here is, is prioritizing grid connections to the ports. In, in terms of this engine for growth, there, there's no, there, well, I would say this, I don't think that there is a better return on investment for, for decarbonizing and, and creating more efficiencies. We also need the planning process and everything that goes around uh, investing in these grids to improve or inv investing in the electric uh, electricity connections the, the, because 
you know, in some cases, uh, if we are putting in a new renewable energy uh, production facility or, or small modular nuclear, the amount of time that it takes just to get through the planning process is enormous. But equally, if we want to bring to bear some of our investment into this, then we also need the ability to be able to act swiftly so that we can, uh, we can deliver. And you know, the Clean Maritime Demonstration Competition, we've also had announcements this week about the ZEVI, which is the Zero Emissions Vessels and Infrastructure. These things are great. The funding is fantastic, seed funding. We haven't, for ourselves, we haven't gotten a huge amount of money around, out of CMDC. But the reason, for, uh, the reason for that is that it is the scale of what we're trying to accomplish here in Dover requires a lot of analysis. So we've had huge support for the analysis that we need to do. You know, I'll give you an example. So, you know, whilst I'm saying we need 160 megawatts, one of the big complicating factors for us is, is how do we push 25 to 35 megawatts into a ferry within 45 minutes? Because that's the turnaround time down here in Dover. And so being able to understand how this is going to work. So what the CMC, CMDC, Clean Maritime Demonstration Competition, did for us is it allowed us to pull together a, a powerful coalition of experts, technici technicians, academia, into focusing in on what our requirements are. More of that, I think, is, is, would be really super helpful. That's what I was going to open up with. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doug. I will just flip back to that main slide. Um, yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. And I think lots of people here today will be really interested in some of that innovative work, some of the future tech that you're looking at. We're also working with National Grid at the moment, who I know are um, delivering the great grid upgrade. So, I mean, they obviously have a significant job on their hands to, um, to decarbonise and get us to clean electricity across the country, which there's, there are huge demands for at the moment. So clearly lots of lots of issues, lots of moving parts that we have to sort of navigate as we take this forward. But I'm sure we'll get lots of good questions on that. So thank you, Doug. Ben, um, I don't think Steve has managed to log in. I think he's predisposed. So um, if you're able to go next, that would be fantastic. I'll hand over to you, Ben. So can you hear me OK? All good. Yeah. Perfect. Great. Well, thanks very much, everyone. And lovely, lovely to be here. I think first thing is sort of elephant in the room. Is we're not a we're not a port, and we're not in the southeast um, in terms of Harlem and the Wolf. But I think just to sort of explain that and why I was keen to participate today is that I think in in many ways shipyards and ports have a lot of similarities. If you think where shipyards are in the country, they're either in a port nine times out of ten, or they have characteristics that essentially are port-like whilst it might not be freight or passengers moving through you know, our, our facilities, we have keys and they're, they're alongside water or they are obviously positioned to allow access to seas and oceans. So I think it's important for us to think about how we, as a, as a broader sector, find those common challenges and opportunities and communicate that because, you know, whilst we might identify a difference between us, there's a lot of things we have in common and, and particularly from what uh, previous speakers have been saying there's a, there's a lot of crossover. Secondly, in terms of, of the southeast as well, we, we're a we're a, a company that most people associate with Belfast. And uh, and when we were talking about cranes uh, uh, in Felixstowe and and, and elsewhere Tilbury, I think it was, but obviously cranes uh, are very well uh, known in terms of the Belfast skyline for ourselves. And actually, that that point about identity and place is something that that clearly resonates when we talk about Harlem the Wolf, I think, and the, the fact that people feel it's very much a part of, of, of who they are. Um, we, we've got a challenge in, 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 in Northern Ireland in terms of our history as a company of widening that uh, access to all parts of the community in Northern Ireland. So people feel that the shipyard is, is, is for them and, and that's something we're doing, but it's, that, that place point really did resonate. I think, as well as our yards we have in Belfast, we have two in Scotland and, and one in, in North Devon. And I think the purpose of, of today's conversation, I think, is to see those common themes across across the UK, because I know we're all thinking about how we best communicate what it is we need and want and what our offer is for, for and to government. So I think that's, that's why I'm here and I'm very pleased to do so. Just in terms of, of Hard on the Wolf today, we've got those four sites and we're focused in, in five markets. So we describe those as cruise and ferry uh this isn't building uh primarily at the moment although we're, we're looking at that in the ferry space it's the refit and repair market 
uh, we're involved in naval defence, and we're uh, I'll come on that uh, come on to that in a moment. We're involved in energy and primarily oil and gas, but also nuclear in terms of decommissioning and other fabrication, and, and then commercial marines, so barges, workboats, tugs, uh, and then also in the renewable space um, in terms of uh, CTVs, OSVs, different vessels that support the offshore renewables. Uh, industry, but also the the jackets and other bits of fabrication that are required. And what this means in terms of the, the discussion today, I think, is that these are particularly well suited to the agenda that we've been talking about in terms of driving well-paid jobs into parts of the country that that have needed that. If you if you think about our methyl site, for instance, up in in Fife. It's, it's a part of the country that has particularly poor socioeconomic outcomes. Big employers have been left not, and, and that industry has not been replaced. And you realize as a company and as a cluster of companies in these areas, you have huge responsibility to, to actually give some of these areas hope and give, give them something to be excited about. Uh, when we you see it when, when the contract is won or there's a prospect of that, you, you see the, the ripple of excitement through the community. And, and, and so much of this is about confidence. And for us, shipbuilding is an industry that globally often has peaks and troughs, and the need to provide that stable work program, I think, is something that's important for instilling confidence. One example of that is when we launched our apprenticeship program in Belfast uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we do it every year now, but a couple of years ago, massively undersubscribed because people People knew that shipyard had struggled historically and thought, why would I, why would I you know, put my um, lot in with a company and, and an, an industry that might not have a particularly robust future? We recently won a significant subcontract uh, as part of a £1.6 billion programme to build three ships for the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, and all three of those will be assembled and finished in Belfast. When that news broke, a number of people applying for those apprenticeships rocketed because people felt there was a a security and a sense of uh, a sense of hope for them. So it's just an interesting observation in terms of the responsibility I think we have to to the communities. I think that picks up on some of the points earlier. So I think in terms of what we're doing more broadly, one of the most important things we're doing following the the news of that naval contract is investing in the infrastructure and the technology in our site because I think. It's all well and good winning winning work, but what you've got to be able to do, particularly when for us we have government contracts, is be able to translate that into future opportunity. So we're looking at uh, advanced automation and advanced production facilities for future orders. I think mean, that's that's really important when we're communicating to government and others that there's that return on investment. Not only is a is a, is a government contract or a, a semi-government contract delivering work, so in our case, 1,200 jobs in Belfast and Devon, but it's also delivering increases in productivity and efficiency so that we can be more competitive and bid uh, through into the future. So I think we've all got a role to play across maritime in different respects uh, around the coast. This work can only happen uh, around the coast, and we've got a uniquely strong proposition to make to those communities in, in terms of what more we can do to to catalyze that because whilst we've seen some pots of funding doug's mentioned some of them in the grand scheme of things these have been quite small and we all we all realize that the transition that we need to see in terms of of a clean and, and zero emission propulsion or uh, decarbonization more broadly the the level of funding required from industry and government is such that we haven't had to try and uh, secure before. So how do we do that? I think we need to be clear as industry, I think Doug touched on this as well, about how we can work together with each other. So this is London International Shipping Week and we've been engaged throughout the week on a number of initiatives to bring industry closer together, to work together, to collaborate better, whether that's around clusters. I know there's an emerging cluster in the southeast as there is, we're involved in Northern Ireland, in the Southwest, and in Scotland too. The idea that businesses sharing geography and industrial activity can, can work better together by identifying opportunities and asks and needs. 
that's something that we need to do more of. Uh, we're doing that. Um, we, we, there was a meeting we had this week in London on crews with competitor yards, cruise lines, thinking about how we can bring more cruise work to the UK. Uh, we, we're doing the same on batteries, working with, with others who are a, a Swedish company, Chandia, uh, who are developing batteries for marine applications. And, and we're saying we're not going to have all the answers ourselves, but this company wants to do more in the UK, wants to work with us to set up assembly uh, line here and to, and to develop more of that capability. So how can we work together to, to drive that forward? So I think there's that clustering and collaboration piece is incredibly important. That is inherently good, but it also is a quite a compelling proposition when we need to go to government and talk to government about only, only what government can do. And I've, I've just to close, I've got three three things that I think from our perspective that only government can do in partnership with industry. For us, one of those is around the national shipbuilding strategy pipeline. The UK government procures, uh, I think it's uh, 150 um, vessels over the next 30 years and for different parts of the UK government. We need to ensure as many of those are built at home as possible because you build those vessels at home, you engage a supply chain at home, you you manage to take on apprentices, you manage to build a pipeline, you manage to have that ripple effect through local communities. So we need to see that, and that's that's a fight always with Treasury to ensure that a higher capex cost might need to be offset through a through life benefit and a, a ripple effect. So, so that's the first. The second is about contracts for difference. Um, obviously we saw the news last week, the week before, about uh, that auction round uh, failing. But we think, and, and, and others, not just us, across the across the sector, that if you incentivize the use of local supply chains through the fabrication and operations and maintenance of offshore wind farms and, 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 and other offshore energy developments, that's going to create a massive wave of work. And there's work to do to ensure we have the supply chain capable, but it's about that demand signal from, from developments. And, and, and government is is tentatively consulting on this, but it's something we need to move quicker on so that we can build that supply chain. And that's where government comes in again. We need to see that co-investment on the infrastructure in ports and shipyards. And again, here, there's no difference uh, between the two port shipyards. We, we all need that investment to ensure that we can actually deliver the, uh, the fabrication and the assembly and storage needed for offshore renewables. Uh, and finally, the point about shore power, all parts of the of the country, ourselves included, need to see shore power uh, rolled out. For us, uh, it's because when cruise lines and ferries come in, they'll want to be able to turn off their engines and, and, and plug in. And again, the same problems that Doug has identified are, are prevalent across the country in terms of prioritization, in terms of uh, capacity and, and the upfront cost, which, which other governments across particularly Europe are funding so so you know those are some of the asks but i think it's important in that context to set out what we bring to the table you know good procurement unlocks investment from business gives us opportunities to work together to create those jobs uh, and go again in terms of future opportunities so uh, thanks very much and look forward to the discussion thank you ben that's excellent i think ties together the discussion and the themes really nicely as well um We've had lots of good questions come in. I'll try and cover as many as I can in the time that we've got. First of all, I just wanted to kick off with a question, a sort of high level question, I suppose. Um, we had an event where we had Lewis Goodall, the jo political journalist uh, in the middle of this week, who was suggesting that we could be looking at December as time for possible general election next year, because the Conservative government will um, attempt to hold on before the elections for as long as possible. Now, I'm not writing the current government off in case there are any government ministers on the call, but supposing that we were looking at a Labour government next year, I'd be interested to hear from our panel what sort of commitments you'd want to see around um, uh, growth and boosting of um, the economic growth in the areas, policy details that can be committed to try and help the growth in your area. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, Kate, to kick things off. Yeah, I think for me, without getting into the specifics of, of any particular theme or sector, uh, I think well, I would hope that uh, any potentially incoming Labour administration would look at the, 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 the broad landscape for growth. Uh, and by that, I mean the kind of structure of 
of uh, growth agencies, uh, including both public-private and uh, combined public-private. Um, if you think about it in the UK, you've got you've got a kind of multi-layer approach at the moment. So you've got uh, you have a kind of a, a national picture, you have a regional picture, you have a sub-regional picture, you have a pan-regional picture, you have a LEP geography, okay, that's being deconstructed. You have combined authorities, you have unitary authorities, and you have devolved regions. Now, generally speaking, we are very supportive of the devolution, very supportive of the, of the devolution agenda, and believing in particular that that key questions around uh, infrastructure, for example, should should best be taken at a at a, at a more uh, kind of devolved regional level. But I think at the moment there is some confusion, uh, certainly in the minds of investors, as to at what layer of geo. I mean, if I think about the estuary, we have about 25 local authorities, we have three unitaries, we have a London mayor, we have the GLA, we are likely to have an Essex devolution deal, a potential one in Kent, we're covered by two local enterprise partnerships, etc, etc, etc. And I think for us navigating that landscape is, is complex, but, but we know it, but I think for the investor, it's not always helpful. And, 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 and just for the avoidance of doubt, I'm not suggesting that every every region should look the same, that, that, that there is some kind of rigid, because there, but there are six pan-regional partnerships in the UK, they all look fundamentally different. Do you know what? I'm fine with that. But I think just some clarity from government around the growth, um, the, the structural framework of the growth agenda would be very helpful. And that's certainly something when we have conversation with the Shadow Cabinet that we are raising with them. Thank you. Doug, is that, does that feel the same for you or your sort of, is your policy focus in other areas looking towards a new government? Well, I, we certainly don't have the same challenges that Kate has with the number of various interested groups that are involved around her patch. <clears throat> uh, but, so I, I probably have two main things that, that I'd, I'd be looking for from a, from a Labour government. Well, many government, but I'll focus on Labour. Uh, for in order to support the growth and prosperity, we need our borders to work really, really well. Now, there's been a lot of great dialogue on the on the um, <clears throat> on future borders 2025, but we've got to really be putting some activity in and make the certain that the borders are uh, that they that on the one hand they protect the security of the nation, but on the other hand they work as effectively and efficiently as they possibly can. So, so that would be uh, one request. The other one is uh, I'd really like to see some real meat and traction around the Green Prosperity Plan. I think from the, the elements that we've heard of, there's a lot of very good things that are in there and the ambitions are great. And, and maybe start by plugging in Dover. That's probably what I'd be looking for. Ben, I know you've just been swallowed up by the sun slightly, <laughs> but I don't know if you, <laughs> I don't know if you um, thought that and had any thoughts as well. Yeah, I did. Sorry, I was very sinister now. Right? Um, I, I think I think I agree with everything that's been said. I think for all of it's, I think, encapsulated by the need for an industrial strategy, uh, uh, which gives that long term focus, which allows investment to be brought in. It allows the various different strands. We, we heard about leveling up funding earlier. I absolutely agree with Kate where the the point around coastal funding being driven into making high streets look nice. I mean, that's that's nice, but actually if you get the jobs sorted, then the rest of it kind of looks after itself eventually. Um, so I think from our perspective, I would absolutely agree about the Green Prosperity Plan. I know there's a lot of excitement in industry about that, uh, but also an appetite to know a bit more. I'm very pleased Keir Starmer's speech last year spoke specific, that conference last year spoke specifically about green infrastructure in ports, and that's great. Um, from our perspective, you know, let's also, does that include shipyards when we're talking about the opportunity to fabricate and assemble for offshore uh, energy? So it, it's the same point, it's like it's detail on that, but at least they're talking about it, and at least there's that, that commitment to ramp up to that funding target in terms of the investment. I think the national shipbuilding strategy that we have is, is very good, but we need to ensure that pipeline is delivered. That gives that steady drumbeat of work into yards around the country, which allows investment, employment, and it gives it helps drive up 
quality, it improves delivery time, it gives people confidence, all of those things. So, uh, but both of those, in my mind, are uh, able to be packaged into a proper industrial strategy that industry works together with government on. We know who's doing what, when, and how we can all lean in to deliver it. Certainly, it does feel, doesn't it, from what's coming out of the shadow cabinet, that um, shoring things up and making sure we have a sound, strong economy to build on feels like the sort of core um, of what Labour's pushing on at the moment. So, yeah, interesting there. And the Green Prosperity Plan's obviously a slightly thorny issue internally within Labour in terms of the commitments around that at the moment, but um, really interesting to see what comes out of that in the next month or so, we imagine, um, as that's fleshed out. Kate, conscious that um, you're on a strict um, time scale. So we, we had a question through which I think touches on some of the stuff that you were saying earlier, which is, um, how have communities from some former seaside towns reacted to the change in local industry and character? Is there a negative perception that the jobs are provided for skilled personnel elsewhere and not for locals? So I suppose the question there is how do we ensure that local communities don't get left behind as uh, we shift towards these new technologies? Kate. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. And then I think this will be my last intervention. I'll have to slip if that's that, that's okay, colleagues. I have to race for a train, which if I'm very lucky, we'll actually be running this afternoon. Um, I, I think it goes back to what I said earlier. I, I, I do very, very much believe in this, uh, that if you go back to the worst excesses of, you know, let's all revisit the worst excesses of regeneration in the 80s and 90s, where, where communities were effectively done to, you know, developers moved in and, and, and gentrified or beautified things. And, and, and somehow that was going to be that was all going to be marvellous. Um, I, I, and I do think that there, you know, some of that still still kind of hangs around a little bit, sometimes at the door of government, not just at the door of uh, de developers and investors. And I think that if ports want to make sure they are able to provide the opportunities for their local communities, they need to understand, they need to understand those communities. They need to speak to Dave. Um, otherwise, they may make presumptions about skills, opportunities, careers, opportunities, which are not accessible for Dave for whatever reason. It might be something very practical, like a bus, or it might just be because of the way, you know, X job is marketed or or positioned or narrated that Dave doesn't feel that it's for him. You know, a, a really good example of that is so often when people recruit, they put as essential some kind of academic qualification, yeah? It's that, you know, essential to, to A level or above or whatever like that. Well, I'm so sorry, the police are so active here today. Um, do you know, I, I, I have got no fucking qualifications whatsoever. Like, I'm not joking, I don't have any exams. I didn't go to college or university. And actually, I'm okay, I do a good job and, uh, and I'm not stupid. So I have never, ever, ever recruited with an essential uh, academic qualification. So, so, so I think think carefully about the way that jobs are promoted and opportunities are promoted, but also go and speak to Dave. Please, please, please go and speak to Dave. Um, on that note, it's been a just huge joy being with you all today. Ben, lovely to see you. Doug, as always, lovely to see you all. Can I just wish you all a uh, very happy weekend. Thank you very much indeed. Take Thank care. Thank you so much, Kate. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, you, you, you know what, if it's all right, I'll jump in because... Uh, because, uh, I, you know, also rising to the challenge that Kate said, how do we know, uh, how do we know we're doing stuff that benefits Dave? So for the Port of Dover, uh, first of all, uh, we have um, we have an annual consultative meeting that is open up to everybody, the entire public, nationwide, if they wanted to, can come to it. And that's where we talk about what we're doing, and we get some really good, genuine feedback around that. The last one that we had this, this year, uh, we had some really good observations about our future developments that came through. We also have a, uh, a port community fund. Uh, so far, we've donated a million pounds into the local community. And what, what that does is it gives us a real sense of what, where the needs and the drivers are within the community. So the, um, the charities and everybody that's bidding into it, we get a real good feel for that. Of course, we go out, once we've granted the money, then we also go out and see the work that they've done. Just this year, we launched a sponsorship program. So aspiring people that are looking to develop themselves and achieve you know, their goals, their aims and success can bid in. And we've got, um, uh, we've got some wonderful stories of, of disabled uh, um, horse riders and, and runners and all that kind of stuff. That, 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 so we, we, we're putting our money into what is important to them. Beyond that, we also have a port user group where the users of the port right across uh, the port, we come together you know, a couple times every year and we, we learn you know what what their drivers are so into and where 
you know, where they're focusing attention. We also have a port community forum that meets three, four times a year. And this is uh, representatives from right across all reaches of our community come together with us. And we, we learn about, uh, we tell them what's going on and ask some questions and they give us feedback and they tell us what's important to them. And then finally, on my board of directors, as a trust board, my board of directors, I've got two non-executive directors that are sourced because they have special knowledge and affinity with the local community and economy. So, and they are active out in the community as well. So I think that, uh, I think that we, through all of those mechanisms, we get a lot of Dave's feedback and, and are really trying to gear, because for us, playing our role, in fact, doing beyond our role in the community is also really important. That's what I was gonna comment. Thanks, Doug. Ben, you spoke a little bit about that before in terms of the community offer and the um, subcontractors and the, and the jobs that you provide locally. Was there anything else you wanted to say on that at all? No, I think I think that's um, I think that's right. And uh, you know, we used to have thirty-five thousand people. If you think about it, in Belfast, who would be working in the yard, and, and you know, many ways they are the community. They're in the yard. We're we're, we're not there now, obviously. We're about a thousand people. I think engaging your workforce as well is is a really important thing. And and you know, these aren't difficult uh, or magic proposals for how you do it. You know, town halls, um, internal newsletters, um, all these kinds of things. And we're you know, we're finding our way with that because you know this is. Or whilst we're a 160 year old company in terms of the brand the current incarnation 2019 since we've had the we're, we're building that up and you know whilst that has its challenges it gives you the opportunity to design things uh with the people who are coming on board at that time so i think you've got that internal communication that internal stakeholder sort of engagement i think is really important as well as that local work and, and the cluster for us is a really important mechanism for doing that because you have your colleges you have your schools you have your community groups plugged into that and it's a it's an opportunity to to get that feedback as you're as you're as you're moving which i think is really really important too and, and i think where you have these particularly significant employers with that sense of place a lot of people are invested in its future and want to want to play a role in helping that so you've got to be willing to embrace that and work with people thanks ben i'm going to try and rattle through two final questions um, we've got quite a few here. We made it all this way without mentioning Brexit, but we have had a question about it, I'm afraid. So I will, um, I will ask that. I think Nigel Farage said it was two weeks ago, three weeks ago, he says that Brexit has failed, which is interesting considering as one of the key sort of architects behind it. Um, the question is, uh, how have you felt the impact of Brexit? What mitigations have you put in place and how effective have they been? So I suppose the focus there is on We've talked a lot about some really great growth initiatives. Um, has Brexit been a setback? Has it provided new opportunities for us, for new industries at all? Or has it been a, an outright loss for us? Don't know if you had any thoughts, Doug, first of all. So, um, first of all, you know, I mean, Dover is kind of the epicenter of things Brexit, right? You, you can't really separate Brexit from Dover. It gets mentioned, we get mentioned quite a lot. Uh, and uh, certainly we've uh, we've seen increased friction at the border so you know passport control customs and all this sort of stuff that happens when when you when you leave a uh, common travel area trading block whatever uh, and but you know we've invested quite heavily we put new processes in place to try and mitigate the the additional um, processing times that are that are going to be occurring for a business like ours you know, we, we have to respond to and deal with the cards that were dealt and that's what we're doing. So we, you know, I don't have a particular, from a business perspective, I don't have a particular opinion about uh, is, uh, it has Brexit worked or has it not worked. But what I do know is in order for us to be play our role as, as the, uh, the nation's primary gateway for, for trade, then, you know, there's some things that we really need to accomplish. And a lot of that is around the sustainable development that I was mentioning and the electrification. If, if that can happen more uh, swiftly, more fluidly now, then maybe there is a benefit. Uh, um, uh, but equally, too, you know, the, the, all the stuff around uh, further in, uh, improvements into the fluidity of our borders, I think, is really important for our, our key trading partner, the European Union. That's my bit, at least. Ben, do you have anything? Yeah, I, I, I think, obviously, we like Doug and Dover, you work with work with what you what you have and and make it work. I mean, I think 
Brexit is particularly challenging in the context of Northern Ireland insofar as it's probably the primary reason for the institutions not being up and running, which means we can't make progress on things like um, investment zone, free port and so on, uh, which is you know undeniable. I think a lot of people were hoping and are still hopeful that we might we might have had the opportunity to think about how we procure things differently. Um, obviously, there are counter arguments that you could have pushed the envelope of procurement within the context of the single market. Um, but, but what we mean by that is obviously saying if we want to support our shipbuilding industry, for instance, we should build and buy at home. Um, and, and that, you know, that, that, that treasury orthodox is still there, which is saying build it wherever it's cheapest. And that's, you know, that's a, so that's something that hasn't hasn't been borne out. But, um, you know, I think it's probably a bit fluffy but i think what brexit did do was give people politicians use this and and the sector was wrapped into this i think into this sense that we were trading the maritimes of the nation and that that gave a little bit of an understanding and awareness but yeah a couple of specifics there but it's it's you know it's it's a it's a massive change and it's it's still fairly early doors isn't it and uh, and but everybody's focused on making sure we day in day out do what we can to to deliver outcomes I mean, it's quite a positive message in lots of ways and the um, you know, presentation you gave Doug talking about the sectors that we're looking to move into, electric, electrification of fleets, we're looking at hydrogen, we're looking at carbon capture storage, renewables, you know, these are significant industries that we're leading on across the board. So um, there, there is definitely a message of, of hope there, um, which is positive to see. We've, um, we've actually run out of time, I'm afraid, we did have a couple of further questions which I'd love to get to. You might be able to have a look at those afterwards. But I'd just like to thank uh, my panel today, Doug Bannister, Ben Murray, and Kate Willard, OBE. Thank you very much, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you all.